afternoon and a good evening. My name is Roger Tatoud and I am Deputy Director in the HIV Program and Advocacy Department at the IS. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, discussion, this fifth panel discussion in our series of online event on a design approach for current and future HIV prevention efficacy trial. I'd like to welcome all participants and our panelists who will be shortly introduced. Today, we continue the previous panel discussion and we will uh, examine a, a new topic, research pathway for the use of monoclonal antibodies in HIV prevention. Uh, please note that all participants are muted. We encourage you to send questions to our panelists at any time through the Q&A box, which is at the bottom here. You can bring it up by clicking on the icon. Please remember to focus your question on today's webinar theme. If you have other questions, we encourage you to send them by email at enterprise at iasociety.org. If you have issue with Zoom, please post them in the chat the button next to it. Um, I am now handing over to Veronica Miller to introduce uh, this, uh, this week's seminar. Thank you uh, very much, Roger, and welcome everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here with this um, excellent panel. In order to, um, to just set the scene for the discussion, I am going to um, share my screen. Um, okay, so here we go. Thanks, Roger, uh, Roger and, um, and welcome again, everyone. So basically, if we just move to the next slide, um, with this slide, I really just wanted to highlight that we've been talking about um, the immune uh, generated antibodies or serum approaches to, uh, to treatment since the 1900s. And this was very nicely reviewed by Mohamed et al. in, in this JID journal, uh, article in 2021. And still staying at the 30,000 foot view, um, if you really want the, 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 the kind of main outcomes of the trial, um, I think one good way of looking at that is to look at Bruce Walker's uh, commentary, The Glass is Half Full, um, where he summarizes that basically two important questions were answered, that passive immunization with BRCA1 indeed protected against acquisition of HIV, but only against viruses that were highly sensitive to the antibody, and that serum neutralization as measured with a standardized high throughput assay may be predictive of protection. So we have a metric there that we can look. Uh, it's an important step as proof of concept. That's, that's, again, we need to remember this was a proof of concept study, uh, plenty of room to improve and has implications for vaccine development, uh, which as we all know is, is challenging. Um, um, uh, at, at the very least, but that the AM trials make the goal much clearer and provide important metrics to guide the path forward. So we have a lot about metrics that we learned from these studies that, that I think we, we can discuss today. Next slide, please. So to kind of do a, a quick whirlwind of the AM studies, there were two studies um, uh, that were done. One was done in men, that's HBTN704, HBTN085, and HBTN703081 was done in women. Um, and this was all administered by infusion. So it's important that what we're talking here was the experience of this trial was an infusion. It was a phase 2B, uh, not meant to be confirmatory. Uh, it was a, a randomized controlled study. It was double blind. Again, this, it was a proof of concept. And the two questions that we already heard about, um, paraphrased by Bruce Walker, if we then put them into protocol speak, basically we're wanting to look at is there prevention efficacy? And in many of the slides, you'll see that um, in presentations, you'll see that abbreviated by PE. And then the secondary endpoint was to define a serum neutralization surrogate endpoint that can be used to reliably predict monoclonal antibody efficacy. So that's really the crux of the matter uh, because I think we have more, we have information about the first endpoint, but it's really about that second, secondary endpoint, the metric, what is the neutralization surrogate endpoint? Um, that we're talking about and why is that important and how can it be useful? Next slide, please. So when we talk about proof of concept, really what we mean is we have a scientific rationale for the approach and we want to see, does it actually stand the test? 
And normally when we think of proof of concept trials, they're pretty small, just enough to demonstrate that the scientific rationale is valid. For example, if we have a completely new antiviral product for treatment, uh, we can test uh, maybe 10 uh, patients that have HIV viral load. And if the treatment actually lowers the viral load, then we know, okay, this, this one is really working. And we can show that in 10 patients, whether it's HIV, HCV, or uh, you know, whichever virus. But in prevention, of course, we need much larger ends. So even to get to the proof of concept, um, because the, the, we don't have that viral load, which would be an equivalent, easily measurable endpoint for HIV acquisition. So for the AMP studies, uh, we have 4,623 total participants that were enrolled in the study to look at this proof of concept. Next slide, please. So the AMP trials, um, you know, I think uh, everyone agrees that there was no real expectation for a high level prevention efficacy, even though that was the prime, one of the, the endpoints of the study. But it, there was an understanding that VRCO1 would not be the ultimate product anyway. It was what we had at that moment that, uh, but that we would need more potent and polyspecific products, uh, which are already under development. But this was somewhere to start. So that was part of the scientific rationale for, for doing this. And uh, when we think about surrogate endpoint, uh, development as a whole, and many of you, um, and certainly um, uh, the Washington University uh, uh, experts are really um, um, expert also in what is a surrogate endpoint and the surrogate endpoint development. And um, so how appropriate really is this neutralization-based surrogate endpoint? We really want to kind of explore that a little bit. Uh, how does the assay perform? How reliable is it? And how would it really function in, in a regulatory pathway for drug approval? Uh, one thing that came out in the R4P presentation, and this was John Mascola's presentation, is when we looked at the performance of VRCO1 in HIV infected patients who did have a viral load, so they were not on antiretroviral treatment, you can see that uh, many, uh, in many of the cases in, in the upper left-hand corner, there was a virus load reduction that VRCO1 um, uh, affected, uh, but two patients did not see a viral load reduction at all. And those two patients then are reflected in, lo in the lower left uh, by number 21 and number 26. And you can see that they do have the, um, the higher level of, 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 of resistance. So when you look at the IC80 of the virus, you can see that it's high and that corresponds also uh, to the kind of data that was used in the AMP studies, as you can see um, in the upper right-hand graph, graph um, in terms of how these, uh, the range of resistance, uh, sensitivity and resistance was defined. And so it's a different scenario. This, these are HIV infected individuals, but I think it really helps us understand the relationship between virus sensitivity and viral suppression by monoclonal antibody. And then we want to then, we can then translate that if, if there is suppression in vivo, then uh, and with people that already have virus, hopefully it would then also work for prevention. Next slide, please. So some key concepts and definitions. And I think here, <clears throat> for me, it's kind of in, in my simplistic brain, I, I say we really want the right antibody with the right specificities at the right concentration to meet whatever virus is out there. But it has to be the virus, uh, for it to work, it has to be the right virus with the right level of sensitivity to whatever that antibody uh, specificities are. So when you see data presented, we will talk about the serum antibody concentration that's usually expressed in micrograms per mil. And that will be uh, in the, you know, specific for each individual participant. Uh, we have the IC80, which is the inhibitory concentration. And that will be the concentration of the, of the, of the antibody that's necessary to, um, to, uh, to suppress that particular circulating virus. And that will be the same uh, for each virus 
for the same virus in different labs or in different people. But then we have the ID80, which is the infectious dose neutralization titer, which is the estimated serum concentration. So taking that first bullet and dividing it by the virus IC80. And that then will of course be specific for each participant and each circulating virus. Next slide, please. Uh, this one, I, I just thought I would put it in there because we're all saying like, what was the assay again? It's the Tiazine BL assay, and we do have David Montefiore with us. He can tell us much more about it, but it's an in vitro assay uh, to assess in vitro the sensitivity of each HIV strain we're interested in to this VRCO1 or in the future to other monoclonal antibodies. And it's called Tiazine BL because it uses Tiazine BL cells. So uh, that, that's the reason it's called that. It's not some kind of code other than it's just those kinds of cells are being used. And it involves measuring the neutralization of on zoototype viruses. So basically you have to take the virus that, that you're interested in and put it into, take that envelope sequence, put it into a zoototype virus to measure it in, in this kind of an assay. That's as much as I will say about it, but, but just to kind of um, keep that in mind that that's what people mean when they say the TZMBL assay. Next slide. And uh, Peter Gilbert did a great job at R4P at the Roundtable 3 session to talk about uh, how we define a neutralization surrogate endpoint. I won't go into this slide in detail, uh, but again, I think what we want to remember is this is a different kind of surrogate endpoint that we have compared to what we've talked about in HIV until now. And um, it's basically, again, um, taking what we've learned from the non-human primate studies and looking at the serum neutralization of, uh, so that means the, the level of antibody in, in a person uh, that we're trying to protect against HIV acquisition and the capacity of that antibody con you know, at that concentration to neutralize the HIV um, variants and, and that are circulating that the person might encounter. Um, in their life. And we can talk about neutralization. There's a lot of work going on again uh, in the area of genotypic. So can we genotype the on sequence and can that be predictive as well? So lots of work going on here. Next slide, please. And um, again, he kind of walks us through, you know, how this would actually work. <clears throat> and I encourage people to go back to his talk to, uh, to get more detail on exactly um, how we would then actually use this to estimate uh, the serum neutralization titer. And next slide, please. Predictions and findings. So this is really my last slide here. So based on the scientific rationale and everything we knew about this antibody, VRCO1, we uh, would have assumed that the HIV that was acqu acquired by participants in the placebo group should be all the different uh, sensitivity ranges, sensitive to and resistant because there was, would be no selection pressure in terms of which virus actually was able to establish an infection. But the virus ac acquired by the participants in the treatment groups should really only be those that are somewhat or highly resistant uh, to uh, VRCO1. And we did in fact see that uh, the treated crews still had some amount of, of sensitive virus that, that they acquired. But overall, you can see that they had um, the highest uh, percentage of viruses was the highly resistant viruses. So 75% of the viruses. So these two things we can check. We predicted that and, and that actually happened. So that is the end <clears throat> of this short overview that I wanted to just walk through um, to, um, to see. And with that, we will now go into the panel discussion. And I'm very happy to, first of all, welcome uh, John Trey. Uh, John Trey Davis is Community Programs Manager at FHI 360 and Adjunct Instructor at North Carolina Central University. So John Trey, let's, let's start off with you and, and kind of um, ask you, kind of, can you walk us through what was the community reaction towards the untrialed results, 
given the prior knowledge that a product would not be licensed as an end result. And I hope that that, that came through clearly. clearly. Uh, what was the insight from the community? What lessons did you, um, as an expert in, in sort of the community reception and acceptance, uh, learn f and from, from, uh, from these studies? Yes. Um, so one, you can hear me, correct? Yeah, we can okay. hear you. Okay. Yeah, so um, Veronica, I really appreciate you going, um, uh, with doing the overview and going over that. Um, so folks in the community, once they receive the results, um, there were a few questions that were asked and that were also uh, the main research questions. Um, one, you know, is VRCO1 the antibody, is it safe to give to people? And the answer is yes. Then um, are people able to tolerate the antibody without becoming um, too uncomfortable? And the answer is yes. Um, and then does the antibody actually lower people's chances of getting HIV? And again, the answer is yes. It, it prevented, um, you know, people from getting HIV or lowered their chances of getting HIV. However, um, the antibody did not have the capacity to protect um, participants from all strains or clays of HIV. And that's where people, um, I guess, had various concerns, um, right? And so um, our community educators at clinical research sites um, did a great job um, helping people understand um, when they were doing their community engagement um, activities and sensitization, getting um, folks to understand that this is a proof of concept. Um, we're not looking at efficacy in this trial. So our community educators and their community advisory board members did an amazing job with that. However, um, we now know that folks in the community really um, were, um, I guess you could say they did not fully understand um, that this is a proof of concept and we're not um, seeking licensure of a product at the conclusion of the research study. And I think that that's where people are really um, having challenges fully understanding. Um, and I apologize, people are cutting grass just, just because I'm <laughs> We don't hear now. a word. It must, it must be nice to, uh, it means it's a nice spring day if people are actually cutting grass. So, yeah. right, so basically, it's, it's, it's a situation where people are told we need uh, science, we need you to contribute to the science, but uh, you will not actually be part of, of a trial that, that will hopefully license a new product. So Jeremy, let me jump over to you then. Uh, from your perspective in terms of asking participants to be in a study like that in the landscape of everything else that's going on, um, how do you see that? Um, to um, you know, reflect on on the the responsibilities um, of researchers and the whole sort of ethics paradigm. And by the way, Jeremy, uh, he's very well known to all of us. He is the um, I always have to uh, remember the full title: Her the Harvey Meyerhoff Professor of Bioethics and Medicine. Um, at Johns Hopkins University, and also the chair for full disclosure of the HPTN Ethics Committee. So let's us uh, have your words of wisdom. Great, thanks so much. And John Trey, it was really interesting to hear your um, perspectives on that. And I assume um, you're talking about what it was like to disseminate the study results uh, with the proof of concept. Was, was hard right, and, and this right? whole issue of 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 uh, doing studies that where we're really because we need to have that that human component of what actually happens. We have the non-human primate model, we have the laboratory, but now we actually need to do large studies like this to see sure, what sure. actually happens. And no, no, no. I, I understand. I was interested to hear. Um, so, so I, you're completely right that that as a proof of concept study we have learned an awful lot. And from the uh, perspectives of enrolling participants who are at risk of HIV infections, it's essential that they understand the nature of the research they're getting involved in. Um, their enthusiasm should match the enthusiasm of the investigators and, and have an accurate understanding of what's going on. So my big concern about this is, is whether um, participants in the trial um, held what we call the preventive misconception in which they erroneously might've believed that's what's being tested is certainly gonna be preventive and then may have taken different risk behaviors, made different decisions about use of, of PrEP and other prevention modalities. Mm -hmm. And um, my worry um, from listening to John Trey is that there was a, there may not have been accurate understanding of the nature of the study and that that's potentially problematic. 
And the check that we have on that aspect of, of trial design is, is informed consent, the ethicist's favorite enzyme. And informed consent is a no joke kind of thing um, in people who are, um, are put at risk. And so um, I'm anxious to see data. Apparently there were some data accumulated systematically at each infusion visit regarding people's beliefs and expectation. We haven't seen those data yet. And I'd be curious to see what people believed over the course of time um, and they're, they're, um, to see, see what that extent was. Great, thank you. And let's circle back when we talk about future trials to exactly the same question again in terms of um, how do we now then engage for uh, future trials testing if they're planned, if they're being carried out in terms of, of better products to, to look at this. And uh, let's move to Yunda. And I'm very happy to introduce Yunda Gao. And I guess she, uh, she is a faculty statistician at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center at the University of Washington. And she was co-PI um, of the Statistical Center or is the co-PI of the Statistical Center of the HVTN. So um, Yunda, in terms of uh, the trial results and the hypothesis, um, what do you have any other or what are your key takeaways and your your key conclusions about what we learned and and what does what that does that mean for moving forward hey thanks um, veronica um yeah so i as as one of the investigators involved in this study it's very exciting and invigorating to see the end results and as you have nicely summarized you know um before AMP, although there were, um, you know, non-human primate challenge studies that has demonstrated um, passive immunization of monoclonal antibodies such as BRCA1 and other products, they could prevent, you know, shift infection, but there was no direct proof in humans. So AMP was really the first study that directly provided critical and um, confirmative evidence that passive immunization of monoclonal antibodies could prevent um, um, HIV infection in humans. Um, so this is really a key um, takeaway uh, learning from this um, from this study, and also importantly, and highly relevant for the development and research of um, an assessment for new um, new maps in 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 the future, as well as vaccines, HIV vaccines. Um, you know, in AMP, we were able to demonstrate that in vitro neutralization resistance of, of the exposing virus to VRCO1 and the neutralization titers of, you know, of VRCO1 recipient serum um, samples against the exposing virus were strong predictors of prevention efficacy. And um, in and itself, it uh, provides direct confirmation of experimental evidence of the in vivo validation of these markers. Mm -hmm. Great, These and David, really yeah. key takeaways. Right, and David, if you want to just expand that a little bit about um, how this then would be used to for future trials, maybe a kind of a digging a little bit deeper into that question. Yeah, sure, Veronica. You know, let me start out by saying that uh, these are very exciting results uh, of the AMP trial. Uh, and you know, the most important thing is we now have an in vitro assay that can predict how well these antibodies and vaccines that induce neutralizing antibodies are going to work. So it provides a guidepost that we mm -hmm. didn't have before. Um, so, you know, just building on what Yanda said, um, we, we now know that these antibodies can pr uh, protect people from infection. And we have a much better idea now how much of the antibody is needed and how potent the antibodies need to be. And we have a way of measuring that, um, again, uh, in a way that is predictive. And so what we know from the AMP trial is that um, the, the antibody protected uh, people from infection by 30% of viruses. This is the um, percent of viruses that have a level of sensitivity to the antibody BRCO1 that was adequate to protect them. Well, what we want is a, an antibody or combination of antibodies that will give much greater uh, protection, that would protect 80 to 90% of mm -hmm. 
of people. So protect against 80 to 90 percent of viruses. So not just viruses that are highly sensitive to the antibody, but also viruses that are moderately sensitive and moderately resistant. Um, and what that's going to take is, um, generally speaking, approximately 10 times more VRCO1, which we can't practically uh, deliver to a person. And so to get around that, what we want is an antibody or a combination of antibodies that's 10 times more potent. And then that antibody could be delivered in the same dose that VRCO1 was, but it's going to now protect against more viruses, viruses that are also not, not just the most sensitive ones, but the moderately sensitive, moderately resist, resistant ones, 80 to, 9, 80 to 90 percent of the circulating strains. And so that's the goal. Uh, the next steps is to test um, a combination of antibodies that is um, at least 10 times more potent than mm -hmm. RCO1. And we know we can do that. We know we can do approximately 50 times better with a combination of monoclonal antibodies uh, that uh, is being considered uh, for the next right. uh, iteration of, of so, this process. Right. So let me just, there's a, a few questions that came in to you specifically. Let me ask them all three at once there in the Q&A. And uh, maybe you could comment on that briefly as, as so that we can move on to some of the other questions and other panelists as well. Um, from Peggy Johnson, is there data suggesting the predictive assay shown for VRCO1 will hold for MABs targeted to other epitopes? From Bill Snow, uh, how do we know if the levels would be similar for viruses that neutralize at a different site on the spike? And then uh, from Mitch Warren, um, uh, he says, thanks so much for describing the TZMBL assay as the new validated guidepost. Um, should this now be the filter gatekeeper in deciding what future NABs and combos go into human trials? So why don't you answer, maybe address the first two questions, and then I will also bring in Lucio to comment on, on Mitchell's Mitch question as well. Okay, the first two questions are basically asking the same thing. Um, how do we know that uh, these results will apply to other BNABs? So BRCL1 is a CD4 binding site BNAB. Mm -hmm. um, what, and there are other epitopes. Uh, would this uh, be just as predictive for antibodies that target these other epitopes? The bottom line is we don't know. Um, however, if we look at the effectiveness of these other classes, other epitope classes of BNABs in non-human primates, we would predict that uh, they would be similar to uh, uh, CD4 binding site BNABs, VRCO1, mm -hmm. with the exception of uh, one particular epitope called EMPER, the membrane proximal external region specific monoclonal antibodies. Uh, those behave very differently in non-human primates from the other epitope classes of antibodies. So that's one possible exception. Uh, and, um, but the combination of antibodies that are being considered, most of those uh, do not include EMPER specific. Um, that, that doesn't mean that it's that, that emperor monoclonal antibodies are not being considered at all. There are a couple that uh, are under consideration, um, but the um, uh, main candidates right now are the other classes. So we still have more to learn. Okay, great. And let me pull in Lucio Gamma here. He's the Director of Scientific Collaborations for the BRC, the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH, also Associate Professor at uh, Johns Hopkins. So for that third question we have posted, um, do you think that this assay should now be the filter gatekeeper in deciding what future BNAPs uh, and combinations we try? Thank you, Veronica, for the answer, for the um, question. And, um, when uh, Yunda, me, and Dave were talking about this discussion uh, two days ago, one thing that we brought up is that this was the first time that we had a big trial with monoclonal antibodies for effectiveness in prevention. 
And uh, we had to base on something. We had to base on animal research. We had to base on in vivo or uh, in vitro assays. And I believe that we still should use those assays for future, um, for future trials. The difference is that now we understand that those uh, results that we thought would be like the most proper for the use of the future antibody that we're going to put in a trial, we should consider that a little with a bit more of like restrictions. So in, if the, in the past we used like IC50s, now we're going to have to think about an IC80 response with uh, uh, antibodies that can reach, you know, like uh, effectiveness at less than one microgram per mil instead of like 10 micrograms per mil, for instance. So we still want to use those assays. We have to use something to base our science before we put that on people. And those assets are gonna still be important. Okay, so great. And that actually is a nice segue into kind of let's talk about what some of these future products might look like and what we would want to know about their science before, as, we, as you say, we put it in people. And um, so how confident would we need to be in the efficacy level of a new product to justify a future trial? if injectable PrEP was the active control comparator. But even before we have an active control or, or talk about the trial design, what when we talk about the, the target product profile, what really do we want? How, how rigorous do we need to be in all of the, uh, the, the science and, and you know, the, the knowledge gain before we put this into people? What, what is it that we're looking for? And um, maybe Lucio, you can kind of get us started off with this, <clears throat> but then I'd like to bring in um, Jeremy and John Trey as well as Yunda in terms of, of really thinking, uh, what is the target profile we're looking for here? Well, we, all, we at the VRC, we have been discussing this target profile for a long time. Uh, we want a product that is extremely uh, if, if effective against a large amount of strains. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be just one antibody. It's going to have to be like a combination or maybe a bi-specific or tri-specific. Uh, we want a product that can act not only in adults, but also for infants. We know that the transmission from mother to child is still very you know, important in Africa. And that would be a wonderful tool to prevent infection during breastfeeding, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, the product has to be easily delivered. Uh, infusion was uh, increasingly accepted by the, by the participants, which was a surprise, but we're not going to be able to use that in the day by day when we give that to other, uh, to like the current people, uh, you know, that live the normal lives that have to go to work every day and uh, they cannot just spend one hour receiving an infusion. Uh, we also have to think about safety of that, that uh, drug, which we are very strict about that. But the other thing that maybe people don't think about is that the molecule has to be highly manufacturable. We, we have antibodies that are easy to make and we have antibodies that are not so easy to make. So we can have like this wonderful antibody that in vitro works beautifully and primates works beautifully. And then we make them and they realize, oh, we cannot expand this antibody for some reason. So we have a lot of things to consider before we really uh, transform that in a product to push to people and then to transform that in a product for license. Right, right, right. And um, so that, that kind of uh, really sets the, the, the scene uh, for, uh, for, for the target, pro, uh, target product profile. Um, John Trey, what else would you want to see before you would um, really um, recommend this to the community to participate in a trial like this? Um, what would it take uh, for people to be convinced that yes, we do have enough science here? Yeah, so one, definitely, I think that the phase one studies that are being done um, is very helpful. And then also encouraging people and helping them understand that, you know, yes, we have the prevention toolbox, um, but also recognizing that everything doesn't work for everyone. We're not a monolithic um, group of people, right? So some people have issues with taking um, oral Truvada or just the scoby daily. Mm -hmm. um, so folks don't want to use the vaginal ring, vaginal ring um, that's been recommended by WHO and et cetera. So um, just helping folks understand that we are constantly developing new um, approaches to HIV prevention and modalities. And that's, um, you know, that's why you need to 
participate in the studies and that's the importance of the studies so that we can have additional options. Right. And um, in, in the panel discussion at the R4P roundtable, um, there, there was a suggestion made or implied or alluded to that uh, maybe we should look at the ability of these monoclonal antibodies to keep virus loads depressed in HIV infected people who are undergoing treatment interruptions, analytic treatment interruptions. So uh, Jeremy, do you think that that would be a good test uh, uh, to, to include in sort of the target product profile um, that uh, we actually like, you know, I showed up one clinical slide from earlier on where we could see that it actually suppressed virus replication and people with the VRCO1 suppressed virus replication in people with, with the right kind of uh, uh, virus that was sensitive enough. Do we need some kind of data like that to show that yes, this does in fact uh, suppress virus replication in HIV infected people? So, so, so thanks. So I, I think it's, it's in a really interesting discussion. I think Lucio did a nice job of starting to map what the target profile mm -hmm. would look like for something to be feasible. And what I think it's the aggregate amount of evidence headed towards some kind of trajectory that makes some sense. So is there, is there a space in the HIV prevention space for whatever product is being um, developed and tested? If there's not space for that product, if there's not a need for that product, then arguably it's not ethically appropriate to proceed, right? Unless you're going to be learning something of scientific value that's going to contribute to another product development. So I think we need absolute clarity about what we're doing. This, what we've talked about so far, approve of concept studies. What we need to be heading to in the future is what is this, what's the pathway to development of a product or products? Are we really still thinking about passive immunization? Lucio mentioned, um, during breastfeeding, that's a really interesting time. Or are we using this to pursue a vaccine, a candidate or pursue vaccine science? Those are very different mm -hmm. um, enterprises. And I think we need to be really clear uh, to each other about what those are. So assuming that there is a space for whatever the proposed product is, then I think we need to g gather the data about the, sort of the social value and scalability if it, if it is effective. But also then, then we get to those questions you say, uh, Veronica, what's the preponderance of evidence? We knew we were very poor collectively at predicting what was gonna happen in a proof of concept study. 20% is not good enough, even for the selected virus. And we have lots of hypotheses, multiple hypotheses being addressed at the same time, multiple antibodies, different things. We weren't able to predict what the virus was gonna be like there. We didn't know how well the antibody was gonna work for viruses we had. And so whatever evidence we can gather to make sure that the next time we do, you know, we put things in people um, that we have some more confidence of uh, what's going on and clarity uh, about those issues compared to what's also available in the background. Sorry, that wasn't completely clear, but it's, it's a, you asked a, a, a sort of loaded question. And once we get all that out of the way, then we can chat about trial design, um, which okay. raises I think that's uh, that's a very good good way of putting it, and and very clear, Jeremy. Yunda, how about you? Uh, thinking uh, towards the the next generation of trials and um, what you've heard so far, uh, when would you be ready to sign off on 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 the next one? Yeah, under the assumption there is a space for um, alternative, additional prevention modality like monoclonal antibodies. Under that assumption, which I do think there is, uh, given, you know, the monoclonal antibodies, like these uh, bigger molecules, they are very targeted and have beautiful safety profiles. Mm -hmm. um, There's oftentimes uh, small uh, molecules cannot compete with. Um, and so there is a, possibly there's a space for it. And uh, given, you know, um, how injectable PrEP has been uh, shown to be highly efficacious, I do think there's a high bar um, that we need to meet in order to uh, even talk about uh, the next um, efficacy trial involving monoclonal antibodies, it would be, you know, we would need to meet a bar around in the range of 90% effic efficacious likely. Mm -hmm. And, and building on the knowledge that we gain in AMP and, and like what David was saying, um, the current, the next generation maps that, you know, 50 times more potent and, and if we can 
give a higher level of the monoclonal antibodies. And given the LS mutation of the next generation monoclonal antibodies, we'll be able to maintain the concentration levels at this very sustainable that level so that you know, the, the, the level of protection can be maintained throughout for a longer period of time. And I think we can, uh, you know, it's this very promising uh, prospect here that we, we will likely get there. Great, um, and certainly I have to, you know, agree with with um, with everything that's been said about this, these M studies, the amount of science cooperation and collaboration uh, that went into this was just phenomenal. So I should have started off at the very beginning to just congratulate everyone uh, for this research, um, but um, you've left us with with so many tantalizing bits that you know, we, it's, it's, we, we kind of need to figure out how do we take all of this and move forward. And, um, and with that then, because uh, Jeremy, you kind of touched on that a little bit in terms of, you said, you know, where's the space for this? Another way of saying it is what is the unmet medical need, right? And uh, Tamban, I'm going to uh, switch to you now. Uh, if, if there is an unmet medical need, uh, that's a huge consideration in, in regulatory review and approval and how regulators think about something. What's the emergency? And that really helps us, uh, or is there an emergency? And that helps us weigh the benefit and the risk in that specific context and also helps us understand what degree of uncertainty we might be uh, willing to live with, right? So you have been uh, participating in so many of these discussions with the forum and with the vaccine enterprise. Um, so from your perspective then sitting in, in the regulatory agency, um, what, you know, could you maybe comment a little bit about the, the uh, contribution of what is an unmet medical need to regulatory thinking? Thanks, Veronica. I, I think unmet medical need is uh, need always figures into the uh, regulatory decision making. But in this case, uh, we do have several products already approved, and there are other ones which will which will soon be become available. Uh, for example, long acting cabitegravir, and it has also shown a superior effect. So, however, I think you know for any maps, any any new maps, uh, we will always consider the unmet medical needs it challenges during the review process. So it's not going to be you know will it will always be factored into our decision making. Great, um, good. So, but in terms then of um, the. Um, the kind of the, the trial design and stuff. So once we have more and more uh, standards of care out there, right? You would also then really look into that in terms of, of the trial design and compare it to arms and things like that, correct? Right, that is true. And when we talk about these, these new kinds of products uh, having uh, more specificity, like a tri-specific product, for example, would we need to know about the contribution of each of those components, each, each of those specificities individually um, before we can really think about the overall efficacy when we think about combination treatment or combination uh, products? Right. I, I know, I mean, it, it would be similar like as uh, monoclonal, I think, I mean, it doesn't have to be always demonstrated in a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. we, the map combinations where the contribution is justified a lot of times based on non-clinical data or probably in vitro testing as they may cover different subtypes or variants mm -hmm. that could justify the demonstration of individual map contribution so what i meant is that you don't have to do a full factorial design with each element being in the study you now each, each maps so a lot of times single map is probably not adequate and we may have to give map cocktails to cover for all these different subtypes. And based on the AMP trial results that uh, you have discussed earlier or our experience with that, it looks like we need multiple maps as one map is not going to cover the, all the subtypes. And also it may prevent a potential you know, resistance or lack of mm -hmm. efficacy in this. Uh, so, uh, so you're, you're concerned about viral escape mutants. Now we know about um, 
drug resistance and escape mutants, but what what are you know we don't really know what it means to be an escape mutant to um, to a monoclonal antibodies and what that might do to the to the virus itself and and its ability to spread etc. I think those are some some important questions to think about um, assessment of long term risk right uh, that that you would be that you would be looking for and um, kind of going back again into uh, to this idea of, of where do we go with all of this. Uh, we have done a lot of talking about acceptable comparator arms and um, how, we, how we demonstrate efficacy for a new product um, with the, um, in the context of what's already available, what's ethical to do. And um, so uh, for a monoclonal antibody, what would you think uh, the active control should be uh, if, if we go forward with this kind of line of research? So David, let me start with you. And then also I'd like to uh, bring in Jeremy into that. You know, ideally I'd like to see the next trial be a placebo controlled trial again, uh, if that is possible. Um, if we're going to have a comparator arm to you know, something else, it would most likely be um, the most advanced um, form of prep. Okay, um, thank you. Um, and Jeremy, your, your comments on that. Yeah, no, this is, this is gonna be a, a really challenging one to move forward. I mean, I think there, there may be a space for placebo control compared to whatever the antibody cocktail or whatever it is is looking like. But the background rate, uh, you know, what's gonna be used in the background is gonna be really interesting. There are multiple design possibilities here. The, the first um, criteria, I think, for the design, de design characteristics of the trial are going to be that we can answer a scientific question with it, right? So we have to be sure that what we get out of that trial is going to provide us with an answer. And we're starting to see a variety, given the sort of rollout of multiple effective preventive modalities, we're seeing a bunch of different approaches to design. Um, we've got, we've had double dummy designs in 083 and 084. We've got Mosaico trial. We've got... Um, uh, a suggestion for next prep. We're, we're seeing people struggling with this issue. So where it plays out here is gonna be really important. But the main thing that we're gonna to have to keep in mind is that we're gonna to have to be able to address this question of providing or at least making available widely effective methods. Um, and so um, given the incipient approval of, of injectable cabotegravir, um, that's going to be a really, it may be a game changer in settings, especially in areas where injection is viewed as greater than oral tablets. Um, so if you look at the differential uptake of, of PrEP um, in both of the two AMP trials, um, what you saw is that you had less than 4% uptake of PrEP in, in the African sites, but in the U.S. sites, you had an overall mean of 29%. Um, that's huge uh, differences. Um, and and we don't know what we don't know the reasons for that, right? So in all of these trials where we provide a preventive package to participants, there there are sort of basically three approaches. You can permit it, which is basically uh, what the AMP trials did. You can promote it. There was some counseling around it, but we don't really know what happened in the closed door between trial sites and participants about suggesting that you know what you're at risk at HIV. Um, you ought to be doing this. Just realize that 174 people were infected during the AMP trials, right? Um, so we don't know whether PrEP was effective. If you take 96% of, of, of efficacy of, of oral PrEP taken right, or 94%, some of those could have been avoided with aggressive promotion and provision of PrEP with, with adherence. So um, do you promote it and do you provide it? And so there are levels of that. And we need to just also be transparent about that. And, and factor that into the sample size calculations of what's done. So big topic, um, large number of questions to be raised, but we gotta be, answered, uh, be able to answer a scientific question and we've gotta actually protect participants to the extent possible while answering that question. Great, thank you for, for, um, for those comments from both of you. Certainly um, um, many of us have been scratching our heads for quite a while on, on, on these issues and um, promoting good science while at the same time making sure that, that, that the participating communities are protected is, is really so important. So we have a question or comment from Nelson Nyoloka uh, and um, um, kind of several parts and it is you know commenting on 
that um, it is so difficult to do these prevention studies in people. And uh, he says there are so many disparities and types of drugs or agents used in managing HIV AIDS worldwide. For example, treatment in Europe not being the same, exactly the same as Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so do you think the health researcher scientists have a role in helping to reduce this compared to those scientists working directly with manufacturing companies? So maybe kind of getting at this question of the responsibilities and, and, and challenges faced by the different stakeholders involved. But um, maybe, um, you know, we could think about that maybe from, from John Trey's perspective a little bit. What are you looking for in terms of equity, in terms of what's available to people uh, when they participate in these trials? And I know we've talked a lot about that with PrEP availability already. So even um, as um, when Jeremy says we promote the use of PrEP, but if the local pharmacy doesn't carry it, it doesn't mean a whole lot. But what can the research enterprise as a whole do to promote more equity across the world when it comes to HIV? Yes, so um, in my, in this moment, in my opinion, I think that um, having conversations with uh, those key leaders and key influencers and decision makers, mm -hmm. definitely. And so I'd al I would also ask and encourage, you know, folks in the community who um, consider themselves to be advocates um, to really um, hold their local, um, you know, policymakers and other key leaders, um, hold them accountable. Um, and I think that that's definitely one way. Um, then also tapping into those other stakeholders um, as well, um, is definitely um, something that will um, assist in addressing those disparities. Mm -hmm. Great. Would anyone else from the, from the panelists like to address that question? It's sort of a little bit more universal and kind of uh, going back to the big picture of it in terms of equity and all of our responsibilities uh, for that around the world. I, get, I think this is a really important um, set of questions and issues, and that's why we're doing this, right? Mm -hmm, I mean, it's precisely mm -hmm. why we want to find the place where a solution like this might be useful. Um, doing great science is important in, in, in informing, um, informing uh, us as scientists and providing social value, but also providing um, modalities for prevention globally. It, one size is not going to fit all, and I think that comment underscores that. Um, and that's why we're here. That's the prize. Um, uh, we'll also learn other things about science on the side that are going to be useful in their own right. But 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 that's the prize we're 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 looking for. And each each person has a different role in that. Scientists, community members, regulators, uh, sponsors. Um, that has to be the the centerpiece. And right. yes, there are all these differences, and it's precisely those differences which call for interesting science and interesting products. And I'd like to add something to what uh, John Trey and Jeremy said, is that uh, maybe for the lay person, uh, they, they see like science, government and companies as kind of like separate institutes, mm -hmm. but we are in constant dialogue. I mean, the, the companies are in constant dialogue with the VRC for listen to uh, the community. We always ask the community all the questions before we do all those trials. I've been like through one of those protocols with you and David and it, just like the uh, informed consent is such like a deep analysis of how we're gonna pass this information. So we are like striving for like a, a better way of doing those trials. And I'm very optimistic that this is how we are seeing this type of problem. It's not just like scientists, government or company, but we are in this constant dialogue with, the, with this uh, problem that we have to tackle. Great, thank you very much. So, um, so uh, I don't see any other additional uh, questions in the question answer box, but um, maybe I, as a last um, question, what we could ask, um, and I'll ask any one of the panelists to jump in, what, how exactly do these results change how we look at vaccine development? Lucio, you have the, the mic, so maybe I'll, I'll ask you uh, to respond. So kind of getting back about that other goal to, um, to inform vaccine development. So what, what would you change and how you think about vaccine development? Well, AMP made our work harder. In, uh, ah, okay. <laughs> yes. I mean, 
HIV is already a complicated virus. I mean, we have to have a vaccine that is better than the virus. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the virus doesn't give us the, 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 the nice uh, immune response that we have for measles, for instance. So the vaccine has to be better than the virus. And now we know that a vaccine has to really generate a larger amount of neutralized antibodies than we were expecting before. Okay, great. Yunda, how does it change for you? You're, with, you're in the HVTN, so how does that change for you? Right, so we certainly, we know, we always know that we have this daunting task, right? <laughs> Even before AMP. Um, but I, I agree with Lucio that um, the bar is raised high for, um, you know, neutralizing antibody generating vaccines. Um, however, I think there's still space um, for vaccines that are able to generate both B cell and T cell immune responses where, you know, there, there may be space where collectively uh, these immune responses uh, can um, work in concert and, and, and provide protection with a lower uh, level of neutralizing antibody responses. So okay. I think there's, there's still that possibility there, just like the, you know, the Johnson Johnson uh, COVID vaccine, right? And right. even though the antibody responses are not as, as optimal as the other vaccines, but it has nice CD8 T cell responses. So, so I think uh, uh, immune space covered would be nice. Great, great, thank you. And David, uh, uh, we're almost done. So just a quick just, answer. Yeah, just, re just real quick, you know, to add to that. Um, with the, how difficult it's been to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies with vaccines. Prior to AMP, we always hoped that a low, relatively low titer of those broadly neutralizing antibodies would be protective. That's not what the animal models were predicting, and we were always hoping that, well, there must be a problem with the animal models there, uh, overestimating how much is going to be needed. What we learned from the AMP trial is that the animal models were actually more accurate uh, than, than we hoped that they were. It is going to take a much higher level of broadly neutralizing antibodies to protect. So as Yanda said, what we know now is that it's an even more daunting task. And hopefully with vaccines that induce not only neutralizing antibodies, but uh, non-neutralizing antibodies that have antiviral effector mechanisms and that induce CD8 T cell responses, that they'll all work together and where even a lower titer of neutralizing antibodies can now have greater value. Great, and that kind of takes us right to 12 noon um, here in, in, on the East Coast and the States, uh, which is uh, the time to end this. Um, I see that Walker has posted a link. Uh, I'll, I'll give a uh, hand it back to you uh, to close Thank us out. Thank you very much, Veronica. Uh, great conversation today. Thank you all, uh, all panelists, for being part of this conversation. Thank you to the attendees. Uh, I'd like to thank my colleague and uh, their organization who contributed to this, uh, to this series of webinars. Um, complementary work is being done by the Forum for Collaborative Research, led by Veronica, and by EVAC, led by Michelle, who was on the call today. Uh, we're all working toward building research literacy, and that comment was made in, in the chat. The next discussion will focus on community and on meaningful involvement of communities in clinical trial design. This will be our final event and will be held on the 27th of April. You will shortly receive an invitation. And we also uh, uh, would like, uh, we welcome your view. We've I've, I've shared a link to a short survey in the chat. You will also receive it by email after this call. All presentation and panel are available on the enterprise website, vaccineenterprise.org. Um, again, Thank you all for participating today. Thank you all for the conversation. And uh, see you at the end of the month for the final event on community. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.